The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond and platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. She is going to tell us about community organizing for free software activists. She has been around free software for how many years, Deb? Five. For five years, and she has seen many user groups and different software projects try to put together community events, and she's run several community events. Are you still involved with Seagull? Uh, yeah, that's um, it's a very back burner project. It maybe next decade there will be a seagull. <laughs> well, it, if you are out in Seattle and you were looking for a GNU Linux Fest, that's what Seagull is about. I'm going to turn it over to Deb now. Deb Nicholson, community organizing for C software activist. Deb Nicholson. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. All right. Uh, can you all hear me all right without me like kind of talking into? Okay, fantastic. So, um, oh, there we go. Wait, oh. All right. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, probably most of you know a little bit about the first piece. I'm going to talk about why it is critical to me in particular, um, and a little bit about the state of the movement now. Some. It's about the overall strategy and perception of the free software movement, both from the inside and the outside. And then, uh, then we're going to drill down into specific tactics for growth. So, um, so if you have questions, now you know kind of what the outline is. Um, so in the 60s, people really thought that um, computers were going to be used primarily to augment the power of the human mind. They also thought that we were maybe only using 10% of our minds and that we might unlock the rest of it with LSD. And then shortly after that, we would discover how to become immortal and live forever. Um, and maybe computers would, would help us out with that, right? Uh, which is great. That, I mean, for a social goal, that's pretty lofty. Um, that's not really what happened. Um, so as community-minded as the 60s were, they didn't really see the, the true thing, which uh, is the gift of the personal computer, which is that it allows us freedom of speech and freedom of assembly regardless of our location. So we can talk about any topic, we can talk to anyone about it, but that, those two freedoms become meaningless if we don't actually control the means of exercising them. So uh, freedom of speech if you're a mute and someone ties your hand behind your back is not so helpful. So, um, so power, uh, a little bit about power. Um, power isn't evil, I mean it can be used for evil of course, but it's how things get done. Um, it's also, uh, it allows you to make choices for yourself and power to make choices include, includes making choices about what's on the selection. So a menu with like one page offering celery sticks and another page offering carrot sticks is a pretty boring menu and doesn't really give you very much choice. I'm not sure how many pages GNU Linux offers to the menu. It might be like many, many, many pages or what the food analog is there. But um, the point is, is that if you're, not, if you're not deciding what's on the menu, then your choices between A and B are not so great. Um, and power does not uh, just get handed out. It's not like a, oh, well, I would like some power today. Um, I've decided, I, I, I did yoga at a super awesome session, I'm just going to go out and seize it. Um, it does have to be seized, and it often has to be seized from somewhere. Um, or from, and that, and that doesn't mean like, you know, beating somebody else up for their toy, but it does mean that there will be some resistance. And, and that's okay, and we should plan for that. Um, it's... It's not going to be a field of dream scenario where you just build it and they will come. Uh, as you know, we've already built it, and, and some people came, but, you know, uh, Kevin Costner has not shown up, and we still have some work to do, is what I'm saying. Um, 
even uh, when things do go viral, it's not magic. That's actually like individual people passing something along to their family and friends, and their family and friends saying, yes, I do think dryer lint is dangerous. I'm going to pass this on. Or, you know, whatever else they decide to pass on. I don't know if you get that one, um, but yeah. Anyway, so free software, in my mind, is distributed power. So for a lot of, um, you know, if you take a monarchy, you have like mono, you have one person at the top who holds the bulk of the power, everyone descending down from that holds power at that person's uh, behest or desire, and it can be revoked at any time. Um, when you have a monopoly in a specific space, then you have something more analogous to a monarchy. So free software, in my mind, is like a democracy. Everybody has a little piece of the power. Um, so today, free software users are the minority. I hate to be a downer, but I think you guys probably already knew that. So as an organizer, Saul Alinsky is considered to be the father of community organizing. Um, he has a great book called Rules for Radicals. If you want to delve into this a little deeper, I'm giving you guys a little bit of a taste. Um, but this, this quote from him is about being a realist. So um, you start from where the world is, and you have to accept that that's where it is. So if coming and preaching to the choir isn't growing the movement, then we have to look at other ways to do that. So, um, so kind of building on that, the low, the low hanging fruit. And um, what I mean by that is that uh, the free software movement does a really good job of recruiting white middle class guys that have kind of grown up knowing that they were good at math and being told they were good at math. and um, you know, we invite them to floss meetings or groups, and they show up, and they feel comfortable immediately. They get the jokes. They, they get the T-shirt with the weird pearl joke on it, like everything. They're like, oh, awesome, my people, fantastic. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the plus. The, the minus is that not everyone feels comfortable immediately when they arrive at our events. Um, how many of you have already seen this statistic? OK. So uh, just a couple years ago, uh, Floss Policy did an international survey of the free software communities. And they found that women worldwide, you know, so some places uh, may differ, but uh, worldwide, women comprise less than 2%. So it's, it's not, I was just having a conversation with someone outside, and they said, well, what if we don't ever get to like a 50-50 men, women? And I was like, we're at 2% now, and I think we have a long way to go before we have the discussion. Is 48 enough? We're not there. Um, we could get there, perhaps. It's going to take a little bit of work. Um, so what happens now, If it, that's such a low number that it's actually uncomfortable to come into the room uh, and be the only one of something. It's like, if you imagine, uh, I don't know if you've ever I feel like there was like a Brady Bunch episode about this or something where somebody was invited to a costume party, but actually it wasn't a costume party. Everyone else was just wearing regular clothes and like one person was invited, like, ha ha, we told this one person it's a costume party. So it's kind of like that, like, oh, I'm wearing a chicken costume and you guys are all just wearing jeans and t-shirts, what's up? So that's weird. So. But there's, the, the good news is that there's specific ways to fix that, you know, aside from not telling people to wear a chicken costume. Um, so we have, we have a movement that I think for um, political determination and, you know, small d democracy, we need to grow. And then we have a huge population that we have not yet reached. Uh, so those, are, those two things are a good match, right? Um, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, anyone here that your GLUG or your project is singly um, responsible for perpetuating, for perpetuating sexism or racism or anything else like that. Obviously, if that was the case, then you wouldn't be here to talk on growing your group and getting advice on, uh, for free software activists. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to do a better job of that. Um, so, lots of opportunity. 
more people are spreading the word about free software means that we have more users, more designers, more developers, and so it's kind of, you see how it's like recursive down here at the, like it goes back up to the top and then it keeps going and it keeps going. So uh, organizing is absolutely that way. So we're gonna try and hold that in our minds as we uh, move on. And so I gave you guys like the statistic about gender. There are definitely a lot of other uh, sites of opportunity, right, if we're going to put the, the happy spin on that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the first two people have mostly encountered that idea that, you know, we, we're, we're pretty white here and um, it's, it's not always a comfortable space for queer people, um, people with disabilities, uh, working class people, and then non-computer non people. So there are a lot of folks, like I, I often encounter, like somebody's friend or their SO, or they're like, well, I'm not a computer person. Mm -hmm. um, my impression is probably most of these And that's why that one's in quotes, because it's sort of like a, it's a, it's a, you know, it, that's a state of mind for, for the person, right? Like, you, if you say, like, I'm not a computer person, then guess what? You're not. And if you say, I'm a computer person who's learning and just started programming yesterday, then, okay, you're a computer person. It's the same with dancing. Like, you can say, like, I don't dance. But the only thing that's stopping you from being a person who dances is yourself. Right. So... Right, so this is more like, take this slide as like a challenge, maybe. Okay. So, um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about tactics in a little bit, um, but they aren't just for increasing diversity, they're for uh, doing a good job of recruiting and retaining new people and um, creating a welcoming environment for, uh, for everybody. So those, those, are all, those are all good things. Everybody, um, Everyone benefits from a welcoming environment, and a welcoming environment is one that sort of straddles professional and fun. Because you're asking people to do work, but you're asking them to do it in the space in their life that they would normally like watch TV or hang out with friends or drink beer or, you know, some something else that they consider fun that they don't get paid for. So, um, in order to do both of those things at once, we have to kind of hold that in our mind. It's um, so, you know, we, we, we treat people respectfully, but then we also have like, like pizza party, thank you for, you know, version two release and stuff like that. So we kind of straddle those two ideas. Um, so this is a little bit more from Saul Alinsky. Um, there aren't any shortcuts. So I'm gonna share tactics, but they're actually, they're also, their work. It's, I don't have a silver bullet. Um, Political uh, organizers have this, you know, silver bullet, this idea that they have named and they talk about because they would really like for it to exist. A silver bullet is basically like a, a very simple tactic that costs almost no time or money but is like amazingly magically successful. Um, I, I think it's like from the, the werewolf thing, like it kills a werewolf. Um, that doesn't actually exist. So all of these things I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say like they're, they're not like, oh, okay, so, you know, just make sure you add the, like, uh, pink smiley face to your website, and all of a sudden the ladies will show up. These are, these are going to be some work. Fun work, I hope, that you'll enjoy. So, <laughs> I don't want to scare anyone there. Um, so, Cesar Chavez is another uh, community organizer. He, he organized migrant farm workers. And um, people didn't really think that migrant farm workers could be organized for whatever reason. And so, uh, and he, this huge watershed movement, and, uh, and people were just stunned. They're like, how did you do it? Like, I just, you know, they were hoping that he was gonna maybe impart some kind of magic wisdom. And he said that he talked to one person, and then he talked to another person, and then like, he kept saying that until the person was like, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. Um, so, while he, he did a lot of talking, and he undoubtedly did in some really specific ways, at the heart of it, most organizing is still communication. So that's, um, so that's what we're gonna talk about next. So talking to people effectively, this is like an overview of the next couple slides. 
Um, these are some of the ways that you can do it. You definitely have to be purposeful. Um, when you're filling up time, like waiting for the bus, you're just kind of like making conversation and you forgot to bring a book. Like that's a certain kind of conversation, but that's not the kind of conversation that you have with somebody that you want to have do some work for you. Um, and you also like when someone like hands you your change, you say thanks, like monosyllabic and maybe like a little bit under your breath. But when someone's just giving you like 200 lines of code or just rewrote all your documentation in another language, then you know the situation design you know demands a little bit more than thanks. You know, so um, let's get more specific. So. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and I have that later. It's like, saying thanks is free. That is actually like the closest thing to a silver bullet that you are going to find, is saying thanks. Okay? So, yeah. Um, so, if you define your goal before you start talking to people. So, maybe you have this idea like, I want to, I think I want to have a user group. And, I, and, and I, like, I, I do a PHP and Python, but I like the Python more, and so like I'd like to do that. So like you might not share like that whole thought process with the person you're inviting. You might say, "We're going to talk on Thursday night about setting up a Python user group." And then if that doesn't work, then you can maybe try the PHP group or a more general like you know we're just going to have computer club. But when you talk to someone who doesn't really know you or like your whole thought process about starting a user group to date. Just be really succinct and say, like, we're going to meet on Thursday and talk about setting up a Python group. Um, let's see. And so when you do that, uh, stay on message. Be upfront about your goal. If your goal is we're going to write an app and I'll get rich, but other people think we're just kind of hanging out, then you're not going to have the people that you want showing up, and they're not going to behave in the ways that you would hope they would behave. Um, so be upfront about your goal, and then you'll get people that are jazzed about your goal and not about some other weird thing that you mentioned. Um, and also keeping uh, attention getting measures thematically related. So like, if you're like this mythical Python group we're setting up, and you're like, Mr. Peanut's going to be there. And you're like, why? I don't understand. So then you're going to get people that like peanuts showing up or like people that like top hats showing up. You know, so unless you're writing like peanut butter rating software as a Python mobile app or something, like keep Mr. Peanut out of it. Um, and then a, a little bit more on staying on message. So um, one of the great things about the free software community is that people meet new people and they become friends and then they become really involved in each other's lives and stuff like that, which is fantastic. But when you have a new person showing up and it's like, hey, uh, I came for the Perl user group. and and you're, they're like, I, I, I don't know, should I ask? Because I'm really wondering what Joel's upcoming engagement has to do with PHP because, like, yeah, I don't know. And so, so put that, those conversations somewhere else. To tell people, like, don't have off-topic off -topic conversations, it's not going to happen. But if you give people a place to do it, then you have another place for new people that don't have all of the history and all of the other inside baseball that you've got. Um, so it could just come and learn about the project or the group. So pound off topic on IRC, or hey, we go out for beer after the meeting that we have in person on campus, and, and then we find out, like, you know, is he really going to give her a ring or what, you know? So um, speaking of events or meetings, they give you a specific time and a place to focus on. Um, so it's, you know, not just a general conversation. It's you know, you, you, can, you can make an agenda and you can get things done. Um, let me see. Should also consider uh, a newcomer's event because it cuts out the weirdness of inviting one new person at a time. And it also makes it easier for you because you don't have to like constantly redo the, hey, so from zero to nothing, you know, zero to 60, like this is what we're doing. Um, so those are good. And face-to-face -face helps people feel connected. So even if you are distributed over a large space, maybe like piggyback on an event like Self and be like, we're going to have dinner at Self. And, you know, so those are all, those are all good plans. Um, where am I? Oh. So planning that event. Um, a public place. If people don't know you, showing up at a stranger's house after dark, especially like what if you have to live in the in the back of the house, like, or, you know, your front porch lights out and, like, or, like, 
the screen door makes that creaky kind of Texas Chainsaw Massacre sound on the way in. Don't do that. Um, also, this means like that people can have meetings when you're not in town without breaking into your house. And you don't have to have your personal address on your user group site, which is also good. Um, entice people with snacks because um, snacks keep people from getting cranky. And it also makes it seem fun. So um, those are good. No one likes to be at a cranky meeting. And then uh, make a plan and stick to it. Whether you're having an IRL meeting or an IRC meeting, you should have an agenda. You should consider sending it out before the meeting. And, um, and then actually stick to that agenda. It's, um, it can be difficult. And so you might want to have like a couple of phrases in mind uh, to do that. Like, you know, maybe you actually put time limits on each topic. So you can say like, well, there's a lot of great discussion, but we just have four more minutes on this topic. So if we're not really ready to make a decision, maybe we should table it for this week and do a little research and get back to it. Um, uh, if you appoint a moderator, then that is someone's job to keep that meeting moving. You can also um, say things like, oh, does anyone have a differing viewpoint to add? Because sometimes you get into this like preaching to the choir fest and everyone's like, yeah, that sucks. Like, you know, or we have the Emacs VI conversation cropped up in your meeting. Like, you, you got to be able to nix that stuff and keep it moving. Um, or if there's like a lot of stuff you don't have, you can say like, hey, there's a lot of information we don't have. Would someone be willing to research this and bring it back to the next meeting? So um, that way uh, you hopefully, as much as possible, get your meeting from like filler to content and you flip it from content to you know, filler. So, um, and that's a, that's a better meeting for everyone, trust me. Uh, so stay on target. Um, when you're inviting people in to your, um, to your event or your project or your user group, uh, think about who you're inviting. So um, if you're inviting students, then maybe you should be having your event on campus. Um, if you're hacking on educational software, then maybe you should be inviting teachers to your meetings. And if you're inviting teachers to your meetings, people who get up at 6 a.m., then a 9 o'clock at night meeting isn't really going to happen. So um, thinking about it from that perspective. Um, one of the weird things about inviting people is that um, if you invite one person 10 times, they're more likely to come than, you're more likely to get one person to come than if you invite 10 people once each. It's, uh, it's one of those things that we all know but we don't necessarily like. It's like, uh, you know, during the election season you get like 50 pieces of mail from each candidate. It's because they know that. They've, like, someone's paid and done that research, like, even if you, you hate that there's like 19 messages from the same candidate, you noticed them because there was 19 of them. Um, I'm not saying go overboard like that, but I'm saying like it's worth inviting people a second and a third time, you know, unless they've told you like absolutely no way. Um, let's see. Um, what if you don't know what the people you're inviting find motivating? Like say you did have this idea where you want to invite teachers to this group or this project. Um, and you've invited teachers and none of them have come. So my advice there is to find one teacher and then bring that, like, can I, please, can I buy you a coffee and talk to you about, like, why maybe teachers don't want to come to this event? And that, that's the best way to find out. Like, really, you just ask people. It seems simple, but it's not necessarily always intuitive. Um, Perception and recruitment. So the easiest person to recruit is yourself. And that sounds kind of funny, right? Like, but what I mean is sort of like a clone of yourself. Like, so I, I worked at a, a place where um, we were doing environmental stuff. And, um, and I worked with this wonderful woman named Melanie. And she was like really perky and had a, like a chipper high voice and blonde hair. And, and she went to like, you know, an Ivy League school, and you could tell everyone on the project that had been brought in by Melanie, because they were also like blonde and went to an Ivy League school, and they were like really chipper and excited, and you know, it was like like they had coffee coursing through their veins naturally, and so, you know, that which is great. But then you could see like, oh, you know, like the mopey, the mopey goth dude, like obviously Melanie didn't 
get him in. Someone else brought him in. So it's just, it's just one of those things. People feel comfortable with folks that are like themselves. And so in order to get around that, you have to actually make an effort. Um, one of the other things about that is that, uh, so your, your, your group might be the most open-minded, awesome group of people ever, but there is already like a stereotype about geeks, and whether you like it or not, um, that is something that we have to overcome. So um, if you talk about Red Dwarf when you're inviting people to your user group meeting, then you're gonna get like only people that are jazzed to sit around and talk about Red Dwarf. Um, and so, you know, keep your recruitment conversations or your invitational conversations like really focused on that and try not to like perpetuate the stereotypes if you can help it. Um, the other thing is, uh, so, uh, so just another member versus unicorn, like one of the things you do when you're inviting people, like you would never say to someone like, well, right now we're all white people, but we're really looking to change that when you're talking to a person of color, because that's really weird and really uncomfortable and alienating. You should just never do that, like, or with women or with, like anything, like, you know, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't say to someone like, oh, everyone in our group now is really poor and we're looking for someone rich because like no one ever buys pizza, like, you'd be like, never do that, right? So just tell people like what you're doing and that you really wish they personally would come. People want to be invited personally, not as a member of a group or as like a tick box. So you can say like, oh, finally, we're not all white dudes, like, or, or whatever. Like, no, no one wants to come and help you with that. If they want to come be part of your user group, then they, they'll do it because they want to do it. Um, let's see. Oh and, uh, oh, and another thing about the perception. So if you have like a website for your group, you might consider putting pictures up there. So like there's this overwhelming stereotype like Linux users groups, like I bet I know what that meeting looks like, right? Like a bunch of dudes sitting around in black t-shirts. If that's not your group, then put up a picture, right? So that people know like, oh, actually we're, we're, we're branched out a little bit more, or at the very least, we're not mopey, we're, we're having fun. Something to like give people like an idea of what they're getting into when they show up. So, it, you know, if it, at least like, Hey, we're we're smiling and we're 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 nice. Is if if you can do that. Um, so making it personal when you do the inviting, we did talk about this a little bit. Like asking, if you don't know what the person you're um, talking to is interested in, then ask them. Um, something that you might say is like, you know, hey, I I read your blog post on this thing, or I I saw that you're doing this like awesome Arduino work, or. Um, you know, my, my friend said that you were interested in, in doing some Python. Um, so, you know, bring that stuff up. Send personalized emails. Like, if you have people's, you know, you're not, like, spamming a list. You can be like, hey, remember when we talked? Like, you wouldn't just go to an event, put everybody's card, and you'd be like, hey, everyone I met at Self this weekend, like, please come to my thing if you happen to live in South Carolina. Like, no, you would be like, hey, Bill, it was great talking to you about like whatever you and Bill talked about. Like, It would be great if you came to our thing. Um, and if you can invite people in person, that's even better. Um, not, always, not always possible, but, um, and then repeat and repeat. Like, sometimes when people say, oh, Thursday nights aren't good for me, they really mean Thursday nights aren't good for me, not, oh, that sounds boring and I don't want to do it. So repeat the invitation. Um, let's see. So once you have people, what do you do with them? Uh, run a good meeting. We talked about that. An agenda. Stay on time. Start on time. For real. It, nothing lets people know faster that you respect their time than starting on time and finishing on time. Um, and actually talking about what you said you were going to talk about. Uh, follow up with people after the meeting. Uh, if you have a, a whole lot of new people come to one meeting, Try saying like, oh, hey, so just five minutes at the end of the meeting, we're going to talk about like what went well and what you think would be better for next time. And people will tell you. They'll just give you information for free about how to make your next meeting better. And it's, and, and it's, it's, it's definitely worth doing. Uh, and then improve it for next time. So if, if people said like, oh, I really wish there had been water, and then you don't have water again and again and again, then people are just going to be like, why did she do that at the end and ask us what we thought and then not 
implement any of it. Um, of course, if people are like, we'd like caviar, then you can say, like, we don't have a budget for that, and it's not going to happen. So um, that's fine. A um, couple of things to remember. When you do meetings, uh, introductions are an opportunity. Uh, and I mean, so you might say, like, oh, this is my friend Beth. Uh, you could even go a little further and say, this is my friend Beth. She's awesome. Or you could say, this is my friend Beth. She's awesome. She organizes the Ohio Linux Fest. So now people know all these things, and they're like, oh, I've always wanted to exhibit at the Ohio Linux Fest. Now I'm really jazzed that you introduced me to Beth. And then Beth knows that I think she's awesome and that I actually remember what she does, which, you know, it's an opportunity. Um, thank people constantly, seriously. Like I said, it's free to do it. It's completely free. And um, use inclusive language um, when you're, especially when you have a lot of new people. So if you have like a lot of acronyms and stuff, uh, try breaking those down or at least asking like, oh, does everyone know what I mean by TCP? Like, okay, I'll say it. Or you guys came to a lug meeting, you know it stands for like a Linux user group, right? And you know, whatever it is. But try to de-acronymize your, your conversation until like you know everybody is up to speed. Um, the other piece of inclusive is, of course, uh, you know, keeping all the racist, sexist, weirdest kind of language out of your main meeting. It should go without saying, and yet, here I am having to say it. Um, and then have, have next steps ready for people. So, like, they come to the meeting, and then, like, you fill their brain up with all this excitement and things that you're doing. And then, then they go away, and what? Like, what do you want them to do next? So, um, if people have said like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll look into like seeing if we can get sponsorship for next time, like, then you, have, you put that in as an action step in the agenda. And you said like, Sally said she's going to see if she can get someone to buy us pizza. Awesome. Or, um, you know, everyone is going to um, try and see if they can check out the repository without it fouling everything up because we, we, we think we fixed that problem or whatever. Um, so. Think of your new participants as seedlings. They need uh, care and feeding, but not smothering. So um, check in with them. You know, make sure that everybody has done something. Like if someone was quiet during the whole meeting, then you might want to say like, oh, he, you know, hey, Mary, I noticed you weren't um, too talkative during the meeting. Um, did, we, did we not get to like the stuff that you were hoping to? Or was it just like really overwhelming or what? Um, and, and then, you know, so f check in with folks. Uh, but don't, don't be all, you know, you know what I mean by not smothering. Like, you don't then show up at their house the next day and be like, we're best buds now. Like, I brought breakfast. Like, no, no, it's too much. Um, so 90% of organizing is actually follow through. I know I said it's communication, but it's, it, it's really actually follow through, um, which is a kind of communication. So y you would not believe how many times um, I've seen groups go and they have like a thing where they're collecting emails and they get all these emails and, I, and I've given my email to places and then like I never get an email back. And I was like, what was that person doing? Like they were just wasting their time for a whole bunch of hours and then also like a very tiny slice of my time, which whatever, but like, you know, follow through. So if you're going to do stuff, make sure you follow through. Um, some of the tools for follow through. We talked about taking notes for meetings creating action steps. Um, keep institutional knowledge up to date and somewhere that everyone can access it. So if you tell someone like, oh, hey, go ahead and like, um, check on how we did that last year, but you don't have anything on the wiki that's more than a week old, then they're not going to really be able to do that. Um, and, uh, and, and make sure as much stuff as possible, you know, I mean, don't put paychecks up there or whatever, but like, stuff should be all accessible. And then, then you don't have to worry. like. Nothing feels crummier than like, awesome, you're, you know, I empower you with the ability to go and do this piece of work for us, just go check the wiki, and then be like, oh, yeah, so last year Bob set up the wiki for us, and you have to like ask him really nicely to get a sign in, otherwise you can't look at the part you need to look at, and then it like kind of slows down the whole momentum. So like, unless there's a really good reason for keeping it secret, then just leave, you know, just leave it out there. Um, Set deadlines and stick to them. Um, and, and check in with folks, like, especially like new people. Like, oh, hey, so you, you said you would take on that like staggeringly huge task. How's that, how's that going? Like, you know, I mean, a little bit more um, 
what's the word, optimistically, like, oh, I figured that's going, you must be about halfway done. How, how's it been? So, um, and then it, sometimes people need help. Sometimes they did take on something a little bigger than they knew. <laughs> and then make sure, again, you thank people, but even publicly, if possible. Um, so, share the work. Work is digital. Um, you never run out of work. There's always more work, like, you know, that can be done, like, uh, if you think about it, there's, there's always more stuff. No, no one I know is really like, well, go ahead. If you, if you guys are in one of the software projects, you're like, we have zero bugs all the time and like more contributors than we could use. Our documentation is awesome and super up to date. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, so share the work. There's always more. Um, and if you're sharing the work, then you, you are able to avoid the bus factor. That's kind of the grim thing where like one person is like mine, mine, mine and knows everything and then something happens to them or they burn out and they're gone and then the whole project or the whole group is like poof. You don't want to have that situation. And, and the burnout factor, like not only is that not good for the thing, it's not good for you. Like if you're like a project manager or like a team leader, um, share stuff, really. like. Don't get to the point where you're like, oh my God, like I forget what my significant other looks like because I've been doing so much hacking on this website for so long that, you know, don't, don't do that. Share it out. Um, and documentation will help you be able to do the sharing. Even more important than the shared work almost is sharing the, the power. Um, so this is very much like a, like a Nolinsky kind of concept um, that especially for volunteers, like signing up for like George's secret project where he's the boss and makes all the real decisions, not a real fun volunteer experience. You would, not so surprising. Um, so don't, don't be that person. Um, the mission is way more important than the details. Um, and, and a good mission statement is gonna help you out. Like, so if your mission is, um, Let's have more introduction to Python workshops in the Boston area. Fantastic. It's really clear that you're not going to be next week breaking into like an animal lab and rescuing rabbits. Like your mission statement has precluded that very firmly. Um, and then when we talk about mission versus details, so the details, if you've delegated something, then that person will have to deal with some of the details of accomplishing that task. And you have to not micromanage. And if you find yourself wanting to micromanage, like just slap your hand and stop doing it. Um, and if you, you, like, you see them do it and you're like, oh, they're, they're doing it wrong, 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 wrong. Try and identify why it's wrong and then articulate it and then put it in your you know, internal documentation so that next time you don't have to you know, have that conversation. So maybe like, oh, uh, we lost our old meeting place and we need a new meeting place. And then someone's like, I found this meeting place. And, and it's like, oh, um, I didn't really give you enough information to find a new meeting place. We really liked the old one because it was handicap accessible and it wasn't very loud. And I forgot to tell you that we need a new meeting place that is also handicap accessible and not very loud. And you have us at like some kind of McDonald's like in a manhole. Like, shoot. So then next time you'll know to say that before you delegate, like find a new meeting place for us. Um, and so when you're sharing the power and you're letting people like do it their own way and come up with their own stuff, um, then they tend to stick around. It's just one of those things. People like to be involved and invested. Um, fostering leadership, we talked about recognition, free and awesome, reward people with more responsibility and then teach them to empower and recruit others. So then you're like constantly sort of replicating yourself and one day you'll be legion. It'll be fantastic. Um, a little bit more on the, uh, on the recognition, like um, consider giving people titles. So if you have like, um, like consider the difference between like our vendor captain and we have this guy, Jeremy, that kind of does most of that. Like vendor captain. Titles, totally free. Or you can ask people and say like, hey Kate, like, it looks like you're handling a lot of the press stuff. Like, can we, why don't we give you a title so that you know, when you talk to media outlets, like, they know you're our press person. What, what do you want us to, what should we have it be? One-on-ones, um, uh, this is a little bit like, 
you have conversations with people after they've started doing a little work. You can do it online. You can do it um, in person, whatever. It depends on your project and what it is. This is to help build accountability. Um, One-on-ones are they're important. Uh, it's kind of this conversation where you ask the person, like, so, you know, you've submitted a couple patches, or you've been coming to meetings for, like, a couple months, or whatever, how's it going? Um, hopefully you don't wait a couple months. And you have these check-ins. It's, it's absolutely not an opportunity for you to tell the, like, I'm sure touching and beautiful story of how you first started using Linux. Um, it, you're listening. You're asking the other person. Like, they're already here. You want to find out from them, like, what's going on with them. Like, hey, so, like, how does this fit into your overall plan? Are you, I forgot to ask. Are you, you said you're in school. Are you doing computer science? Oh, you're not. You're doing marketing. That's interesting. Or, like, I know you've been helping with the website. Like, are you enjoying that? Like, oh, you just took that on even though you hate it, but you noticed it needed to be done. Maybe we should try and move that around so someone that doesn't hate it is doing it. Um, so. Listen to how people are feeling about it. Make it better. This is going to help you, you know, not only to understand why people are here, but it might give you an inkling about uh, some of the people who left. Like, why did they leave? So, um, and make sure you stay on topic. Like, this is not like a weird, um, like an opportunity to be like, huh, so you're Buddhist. What's that like? Like, no, don't do any of that. Like, keep it on topic. Like, or like, I notice you're not married. No, no, none of that. These are like, these are like friendly, but like, keep that line. So, the one-on-ones. And, um, and let's see. So, that's like, that's the recap. Um, you know, you, you guys were just here. This, this is what we did. Uh, more people than different people. Larger and more successful free software movement. Hooray! Um, invite people thoughtfully and repeatedly. Um, share the work and the decision making and then people will feel like your project is their project and they might even do more work on it than you do, which is an exciting thing to have happen. Um, make sure people are getting something back. Like, give them a title that they can put, like, even unpaid whatever on their resume. Make sure that, you know, if they're like, oh, I, I signed up to work on this because I thought I was going to learn, like, PHP. And then if they're not learning PHP, like, figure out how to change it so they are learning PHP. Um, and then always be fostering leadership. Like, you're always kind of, like, trying to organize yourself out of a job when you do these things. So that, you know, if you, uh, you know, maybe you have, like, a relative leaves you, like, a little island in the Pacific with no Wi-Fi. And you're like, I'm going to go live on an island, you know. The, the project goes on without you. And maybe if you're like, living on an island was boring, you come back two years later and the project is going even stronger and better than before. So always be fostering leadership. Um, I am going to open it up for questions. So people have questions. Yes. Right, so um, for you, oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, so the question is, how do you reach into communities, uh, like, for instance, the Hispanic community that you're not, that you already have people from? Um, and uh, I'm going to say, so Free Geek in Portland started doing um, more outreach to the Spanish-speaking population in Portland there, and one of the things that they found was really successful, uh, one, they went to where uh, folks were already gathering. They didn't, like just continue to invite them to come here, like where they are. They went to places where people were already gathering and were like, hey, we have this thing, like, um, at the end of it, you get a free computer? Like, what do you think about that? And they were like, yeah. And then what they did was they had, um, they have, like, shift captains that are Spanish speakers. And they do, they've passed on most of the recruiting and organizing of those shifts to Spanish speakers. So. To start, find yourself an a ally in the community, and that means not just like going through the list of folks that we have, but going to where people are and talking to them. Like maybe it's like, oh, I'll go to the library and I'll see like who works at the library on the tech stuff over there that's a Spanish speaker, or you know, I'll go to like 
some some kind of like a open house or a festival or uh, something in that neighborhood that you're interested in reaching out to and say like, hey, this is what we're doing. Is that interesting? Like, we'd really like to um, make this like a bilingual sort of venture. Other questions? All right, are you guys ready to like go out and become Legion now? Really? Yes? Okay, awesome. Then we win. Um, oh, here we go. Um, so, oh, I'm looking for work. Um, but you can also email me even if you don't want to give me money. Uh, if you have questions that occur to you later. Um, I put together some resources here uh, on the FSF's um, Libre Planet Wiki. And uh, it's, it's under the Women's Caucus, but there's a lot of stuff about doing organizing, like specifically for free software organizing. And then uh, that was the name of the book that I mentioned, Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky. So, and it'll, it's at your library, or you can buy a copy, whatever you like. So thanks so much. I can help with like that. It. We yeah. have the same problem. What would happen if you did this? You gave me a I found a problem. How do you do that? It's like this. Well, I disagree with it. Really Let's put the word out. Let's put the word out. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.